you much for the invitation. It's my great pleasure to uh, attend this conference and visit IIAS. Okay. So today I will talk about the uh, di distribution of primes in different settings. So I will start with the one. <laughs> Which block? I mean, I, I will use this. I, that's OK. I will use this. <laughs> so I will start with the distribution of the uh, well-known primes. This is what Peter mentioned in his talk yesterday. Actually, I'm just backtracking. OK. So uh, it's, I'm OK. I'll just do this. Okay. So already in 300 BC, Euclid showed that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So the question is that uh, how do these prime numbers uh, distribute? So uh, in 18, 1896, Adamard and uh, de la Poussin proved the uh, prime number theorem, which says that uh, the number of okay, so the number of primes up to x is about x over log x when x is very large. But actually, well before this theorem was proved, Gauss already conjectured that uh, the uh, pi x should behave like a logarithmic integral. That's from integral from 2 to x of 1 over log t dt. Okay. So if one uses the integration by parts, you will see that the first term is exactly x over log x. So therefore, we can also say that a pi x behaves like logarithmic integral. Uh, the, the actually numerically, uh, the Lix approximate uh, uh, pi x better than x over log x. So, so to see uh, why this approximation holds and what is the error term, uh, we, what we do is that we introduce a zeta function. So we take a product over all the primes. And the function here is 1 over 1 minus p to the minus s. Okay. And when we expand this, we see that this infinite product is the same as infinite sum, 1 over uh, the positive integers raised to the s. So this is the well-known uh, Riemann zeta function. And both the infinite sum and the infinite product converges absolutely for the real part of s greater than 1. So then this function can be analytically continued to the whole S-plane, which is holomorphic everywhere except for a simple pole at S equal to 1. Okay. And uh, we also know, need to know the uh, zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Okay. So on the right half plane, real S greater than 1 because the infinite product converges, so it never vanishes. Then one can also show that a zeta also, there vanishes on the line real s equal to 1. Okay. Then to the left of the line real s equal to 1, um, one knows that a zeta has a trivial simple 0 at a negative uh, even integers. Okay. And the interesting non-trivial 0 lie in the critical strip, real part of s between 0 and the 1. Okay. So if we let beta be the maximum, of the real part of the zeros, then uh, when we approximate pi x by the lix, then the error term is uh, x to the beta times log x. So if one assumes the Riemann hypothesis, which says that uh, the, all the non-trivial zeros lie on the line of symmetry, namely real s equal to 1 half. So in this case, we know that uh, beta is equal to 1 half then we have the best possible error term, x to the 1 half times log x. So uh, let me very quickly explain why we have uh, this uh, expression. So we first is that we take this expression, zeta here, we take a log, then we differentiate both sides. So the right-hand side, when you differentiate that, you write it as a Dirichlet series, you only have powers of p showing up. And uh, because it comes from the differentiation, so yeah, 
the uh, coefficient in front will be just uh, log p. Okay. So that's the first uh, expression. Then the second expression is that from this uh, first formula here, one obtains the so-called explicit formula. So uh, one forms the partial sum of the coefficient. Okay. So remember that only the, the log p will show up in here. Okay. And this partial sum for x non-integer can be expressed in terms of the uh, singularities of the left-hand side. So because I have a minus sign here, so the simple pole contribute to term x, and all the other <coughs> zeros will contribute to this sum, x to the row over row. Okay, and there's a constant term. Okay. So the left hand side basically it's it's basically can think of that as accounting the primes up to x, but with the weight of a log p. So this you see the main term and the error term. Okay. So now we go to the uh, compact Riemann surfaces. Well, the group SL2R acts on the uh, Poincaré of our plane by fractional linear transformation. Okay. So we take a discrete torsion-free co-compact subgroup, okay. and we like to look at its orbit space, okay. H mod gamma. Okay. So this uh, quotient here is a compact Riemann surface, okay. and because this uh, a power plane is simply connected, and the gamma here is torsion free, so gamma turns out to be the fundamental group of this Riemann surface. So for this Riemann surface, what we are interested in counting is the uh, uh, geodesic cycle. Okay. So for geodesic cycle, we have the starting point and with this orientation. We are going to ignore the starting points, but we are going to keep the orientation. So we, we, so we look at, we're interested in the closed uh, geodesic cycles, okay. um, but forgetting about the starting point. And among those, we are interested in the primitive ones. That means that uh, that cycle is not obtained by traveling along cycle of shorter length several times. Okay. So namely, it's a P is not a, instead of P power. Okay. So then Selberg uh, introduces the famous Selber zeta function by taking product over such primes. Okay. So this is the way that Selberg defined uh, his zeta function. And uh, he proved that uh, this zeta function has a behavior just like the Riemann zeta function. Namely, it is uh, uh, holomorphic and non-vanishing on the uh, uh, half plane real s greater than or equal to 1, okay, except for a simple pole at s equal to 1. And also, it's a non-trivial zero lie in the critical strip, real s between 0 and the 1, except that in this case, the non-trivial zeros of the uh, Selber zeta function can be expressed using the eigenvalue of the Laplacian on the, the uh, Riemann surface. Uh, so such, uh, most of them will lie on the half line, real s equal to 1 half. Those which will not will lie on the, the real part, okay, on the interval between 0 and the 1, and the symmetric with respect to 1 half. Okay. So in his thesis, uh, Peter Sarnak proved the prime geodesic theorem, okay, which counts the, uh, the number of primes uh, of length up to x. Okay. So to uh, his theorem, well, gives us the main terms, the logarith logarithmic integral of x, but he also uses the, the other uh, real zeros, okay, which are off the line, uh, center line. So real zeros between half and the one. Okay. So each of them also contribute to a log logarithmic integral. Okay. Then the error term is x to the 3 quarters times log x squared. So here I just want to remark that uh, uh, Selberg himself conjectured that uh, Peter also mentioned yesterday that uh, when this gamma is a congruent subgroup, then uh, there shouldn't then all the non-trivial zeros should uh, lie on the line of uh, symmetry real s equal to one half. So all this t1 up to tk should not be there. 
So then, uh, next is that uh, Ihara look at uh, what Selberg did for the Riemann surface. So we take this uh, upper half plane, mod out by gamma here. Okay. The upper half plane itself has an expression as a homogeneous space, as a PGO2R modded by its maximum compact subgroup. So Ihara said, well, what happens if we replace this field R by a piadic field? Okay, this is what he does. Okay. So we can think of that piadic field as a QP, or we can think of it as a finite characteristic. That'll be the uh, field of Lorentz series over a finite field, FQ. Okay. So, or we can take their finite extension. So let's assume that uh, our piadic field has Q elements in this residue field. Okay. So then what replaces the upper half plane is the PGO2F mod out by its maximum compact. So uh, it turns out that uh, they are the vertices of a Q plus one regular infinite tree. Okay. So just like before, we take a discrete torsion-free co-compact subgroup gamma and the mod out on the left-hand side. So we have a finite quotient on the one hand. So those are the vertices of a finite Q plus one regular graph. Okay. And also the uh, gamma is its fundamental group. Okay. And so similar to the case of compact Riemann surface, we are interested in the closed geodesic cycles and not counting the starting point. And uh, we want them, if they are primitive, we call that a prime. So, Ihara introduced the zeta function associated to uh, this finite graph by taking product over all the primes. And the factor looks like what we saw for the uh, Riemann zeta function, 1 over 1 minus u to the length. Okay. And uh, this infinite product, actually, you can also express it in another way. It shows that uh, this zeta function really <coughs> counts the number of closed geodesic cycles of length by the counting the starting points. So uh, formally, this zeta is defined as this infinite product. Most of the time, this infinite product is, <laughs> so let me say it again. The uh, zeta function is defined as a product over primes. Most of the time, this is infinite product. <laughs> At this time, I don't know whether it's infinite or finite. <laughs> okay. So, and then uh, it turns out that uh, this product, infinite or finite, actually can be expressed as one over a polynomial. And this polynomial is the uh, well, inverse polynomial of the characteristic polynomial of an operator. So this operator combinatorially is the adjacency operator on the directed edges on the graph. Okay. So this graph originally doesn't have any direction. For each edge, we give it two directions and the uh, for a directed edge, and all its neighbors will be all the edges coming out of the, uh, the ending point of the previous edge, except that you, you do not count the one which goes back. Okay. So originally, the graph is a Q plus one regular, then this T will show that uh, each directed edge has Q neighbors. Okay. Is it automatic? <laughs> okay, so, so therefore this, <laughs> so this means that uh, the, uh, this product, if it's infinite, then it's, we want to look at its convergence, the, the interval of convergence. So that means that we, are, we want to know, well, the zeros of the polynomial in the denominator here. So in case of a Q plus one regular graph, the largest eigenvalue in the bottom here is Q, okay? So uh, this will tell you that uh, uh, this zeta function itself converges absolutely for the, for the absolute value of U less than one over Q, okay? So uh, <coughs> this actually is similar to the, uh, the right half plane we talked about before. If you 
think of u is q to the minus s, this is the same as real part of s greater than 1. Okay. And so if a graph is a bipartite, then there's another uh, eigenvalue of the same absolute value, uh, namely minus q, which shows up in the, as a zero of the uh, denominator. Okay. So, so in general, if a graph is a tree, then we know that has no cycle, so the, uh, so, so the zeta function will be one. If the graph is homotopic to a cycle, then this graph only has two primes, one direction and the opposite direction. And uh, so we assume that uh, the fundamental group has ranked at least two, so there are infinitely many primes. Then we talk about distribution of primes. Okay. So uh, <laughs> this is the uh, prime geodesic theorem for graph proved by Hashimoto. So this is analogous to what we saw for compact Riemann surface. Okay. So to describe this uh, result, one needs uh, another information. So it is that uh, we need this quantity, which is the GCD of the length of all the primes. Okay. So the, uh, the result says that if we count the primes whose length is n times uh, the GCD, then the number of such primes is Q raised to the n times, uh, so it's the length over n. If we count those primes of length strictly less than n times delta x, it is only a proportion of what we saw before. So this phenomenon is exactly the same as the case that if we count the uh, points of a variety defined over finite fields. That's exactly this thing. Okay. And uh, this uh, prime number the uh, prime geodesic theorem for graph holds in general. If the graph is uh, not regular, it, you, you get exactly the same expression, except that in this case, you replace this Q by the largest eigenvalue of that operator T in absolute value. Okay. And to prove it, uh, the method is the same as what we saw for what happened for the ordinary primes. You take a logarithmic derivative of zeta function, and to get a similar explicit formula. And uh, so also in this case, if our graph is Ramanujan, that means that all the non-trivial uh, poles of the zeta function will have the same absolute value, q to the minus 1 half. In this case, we also have good description of the error term. Okay. And the, you see the error term, the numerator is the square root of the main term we saw. So now I want to go from PGO2 to PGO3. Okay. So PGO2 uh, is uh, associated to a tree. For PGO3, it's a two-dimensional building. And this building is obtained by gluing together things called apartment. So each an apartment is now a two-dimensional Euclidean plane. But it's tiled by uh, equilateral triangles. So each triangle is called a chamber. And the, the vertices of the uh, <laughs> building associated with PGO3 are parameterized by PGO, PGO3F modeled out by maximum compact subgroup, just like what happened for PGO2 case. So uh, here, if we are on an apart, so the building is obtained by gluing the apartment together along the triangles. I think uh, the best picture I saw is uh, what shows up in the poster of this conference. There's a building on top of a building, and there's a <laughs> a pizza, the a building associated with PGO3, things like that. OK. So if we take uh, any vertex, OK? So in an apartment, it has uh, six edges out of it, three of which we call the type 1. And the other three we call the type 2. So the endpoints of type 1 edges are described by the heck operator we call A1, which has determinant uh, pi, a uniformizer. And uh, the endpoints of type 2 edges are, 
are described by second pair calculator whose determinant is pi squared. Okay. <laughs> and as you can see that uh, if we travel in the opposite direction, then type two edges become type one and type one becomes type two. Okay. So in this case, uh, we also take a discrete torsion-free co-compact subgroup mod out on the left-hand side. Then we get a, a finite two-dimensional complex. Okay, so this is uh, what we are interested in. Okay. So on this complex, we are interested in two kinds of primes. Okay. Because this is two-dimensional, one kind of prime is one-dimensional uh, prime cycles. Okay. And then we also have two-dimensional uh, prime galleries. Okay. So for the prime cycles is that uh, the Euclidean metric on each uh, apartment, well, induces Euclidean metric on the quotient. So if I take a geodesic cycle on the quotient, it lifts to a straight line on some apartment. So then we are interested in that straight line. First, we will go through some vertex. Okay. Secondly, we, are only, we will only count the straight lines which are contained in the, uh, what's that called, the uh, skeleton or the building. Okay. So which means that if I start from this point, if I follow this type 1 edge, then because it's straight line, it can only continue this way. Okay, likewise, the other one. So therefore, we are looking at the, the uh, prime geodesic cycles after you're lifting up that uses only type 1 edges or use only type 2, well, which is the same as those using type 1, but just traveling in the opposite direction. So this is what we are counting. So we are counting the uh, primitive closed geodesic cycles, not counting the starting point, contained in the one skeleton, and using only the type 1 edges. Okay. So we take the, the product. And just like what we saw for the graph, so there's also an operator which talk about adjacent, using, <coughs> describe the adjacency of the uh, type 1 edges. Okay. And uh, in number theoretic terms, uh, these are the parahoric uh, operators. Okay. So let me just go back a little bit. So if I start from, say, this type 1 edge, as, as I said, in order to be geodesic, it can only continue to go this direction. But, out, but this type 1 edge has other type 1 neighbors, which is going upwards or going uh, southwest. Okay. So then these two, uh, point, these two edges are not adjacent to this. So the adjacency operator only pick up part of the all adjacent edges. Okay. <laughs> and uh, then, similarly, for the type 2 case, is that I will start with a chamber. So I'm going to, tr to travel to the adjacent chambers. Okay. And uh, uh, to be geodesic means that it would travel out like a, a band, like strip, like this way, or like that way. And the third one will be horizontal. Okay. So we have three directions. Uh, three, three possible strips. Then for each strip, we can have two possible directions uh, going up or going down. So <coughs> the same with each. So I just want to choose the direction so that say, I want that, that they would be the direction such that the boundary is always type 2, for instance. Okay. And uh, that kind of, uh, <coughs> get, mm. so that will give us the uh, Geodesic galleries, uh, again, we choose the primary ones, not counting the starting chamber, and call that a prime gallery, and take doing product. So this defines a, a zeta function for the gallery, for the chamber. And again, so there is a Heka Iwahori Heka operator describing it. Okay. So another rank two group is a symplectic group, SP4. So again, each uh, apartment is two-dimensional. And uh, each chamber now is uh, uh, isosceles right triangle like this. Okay. 
Now you notice that the vertices have two colors, the black ones and the red ones. So the black ones are called the special vertices, and the special vertices are parametrized by PGSP4 modeled out by its maximum compact subgroup. And then the, uh, the red vertices are called the non-special vertices, so they are sort of awkward. Okay. So out of each special vertex, you see two kinds of edges. One is between special to special, okay? So in this case, in this joint is slanted. So we call this a uh, uh, spin type edge. And the endpoints of spin type edge are parametrized by one kind of head operator, A1. And the second kind is that it uh, goes horizontally and vertically, starting from the special vertex, through the non-special vertex, then reaching at the special vertex. So then I have uh, east, west, and north, and south. And so then the, the endpoints are described by the heck operator A2. Okay. So similar to what we saw before, we take a discrete torsion-free co <coughs> group modeled out on the left. Okay. So we consider the one-dimensional primes, what we call the prime cycles. Now there are two kinds. One kind uses only spin type edges, okay. and another kind uses only standard type edges. So in each case, again, we have some operator uh, describing it <laughs> such that all each of this is one over a polynomial and described by the determinant of identity minus some operator times u. Okay. Now, for the chamber, it's a little bit more complicated than what we saw for the PGO3 case. So now this joint is also <laughs> sort of rotated from the previous joint. Now I put it this way. So uh, this, this edge between special vertex and special vertex, this is uh, of the spin type edge. So if I take a uh, chamber, okay, in this apartment, it has this spin type edge. So I glue it with the other chamber with the same spin type edge. Put together, I have this square, okay? So I call this square uh, the quote-unquote chamber of uh, spin type. Then I move this square diagonally, this way and that way. Okay. And uh, if the, the other kind is that I take this chamber, I glue the, uh, the other chambers in this apartment which share the uh, standard type edge. So in this case, I end up with the gluing four together <coughs> to get a square. Then I take this square, I travel horizontally and vertically. Okay. So, so in each case, we will consider the galleries of a type, which is a spin type, or which is a standard the type. Spectrum, uh, the zeros of these zeta functions, they have one variable at the spectrum of G, G being the, the other group, but not spherical stuff. I think you said so. It's not, uh, it's not they're not, right? It's in. Heck operators are not here. But, okay, By you tell us the, the, where the zeros are, right? I'm going to discuss the okay, zeros. <laughs> <laughs> so. So in all the cases, we have seen that we have the zeta function defined as a product of the primes of given type. And each of cases has a shape of one of a polynomial of some operator in there. Yes. So as we saw from the case of graphs, to understand the distribution of primes, I need to understand the uh, pole or, or the zeros of, or the eigenvalues of this operator. OK. So here's the summary. So we're going to consider that the two-dimensional case uh, is either coming from the quotient of the building of PGO3 or the uh, building of SP4. Okay. So the zeta function all have this type. Okay. So now the key point is to find out what is the largest eigenvalue of this operator and also find out its uh, multiple, well, how many eigenvalues does this operator have which have the same absolute value, okay? That's going to give you the, the distribution of primes. Okay. So to, to do that, we want to use the peron fobenius theorem, okay? Uh, before doing, so in order to use that, 
Uh, this is joint work with my PhD student, Matthias. Okay. So the first thing we show is that uh, in this finite quotient, if given any two edges or two chambers of the same type, uh, there is, uh, they are connected by a geodesic path of the same type. So each time, I always stress that uh, the operator only uses a part of the neighbors. So there are certain neighbors which uh, are not considered as adjacent uh, you, and with respect to the operator. But uh, nonetheless, you can still find uh, geodesic paths can connecting those non-adjacent uh, edges. Okay. So after we, we have uh, proved this, from that we can determine the GCD of the length of the prime geodesic cycles or geodesic galleries. Okay. This is what we call a delta, which is a thing, another thing we saw we call a delta x for the graphs. Okay. So once we have this information, then we can use peron felbeni theorem to, to show that the largest eigenvalue in absolute value of this t, okay, that uh, we can determine, through, okay, and to show that all the eigenvalues of the absolute value, uh, the same absolute value, they each of that has a multiplicity of one, and uh, the number of such is given by this GCD of the length delta. Okay. So here is the uh, the result. So if I look at the uh, geodesic cycles, a uh, prime geodesic cycles or galleries of the given length, so we have this uh, lambda largest eigenvalue in absolute value raised to the length over n, okay? And if the less, then the proportion of it, okay? So this is always the case, so namely the kappa is equal to one, except in the very special case that uh, we look at the uh, the galleries of standard type. So in that case, uh, I lied a little bit in the previous slides. So that is that uh, that operator actually decomposes into two blocks. Each block had this behavior. So, uh, so this uh, keeps, tells you that uh, what is the lambda, what is the delta, and so on. Okay. So, uh, so Huh? The rest of the zeros or poles? <coughs> Do you have any interpretation in terms of automorphic forms like Selberg has for the rest? No? <laughs> the uh, it's true, by the way. He tried to define a Selberg zeta function, the higher rank, and he failed. That was my open question at the end. Uh, <laughs> what he was able to do was make special kind of geodesics which are kind of cycling around in what and and what uh, Moscovici ah. developed the standard further. But somehow, the, you sort of think you're supposed to have a function of two, of several complex variables. Uh, and that's so, so you don't know the answer. What's I the answer? You're only looking at the Perron Frobenius idea. Right? Here, I only look at, I mean, to get this theorem, I the only point. use Perron Frobenius. So no, the, the, the other ones will come into the error term of this approximation. So if the, uh, if the uh, quotient is Ramanujan, then you also, you also can say something about error term, just like what happened for the graphs. Oh, so you do have an interpretation. I do have interpretation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so I can do that. But uh, not for the uh, GSP4 case, because I don't have Ramanujan. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, In case of Ramnujan, I can. Uh, so the, the answer to the question is the other zeros of this function, of mm. one complex, of one variable, right. they are given in terms of occurrences in automorphic spectra. They, they, they will show up. They have, yeah. they have an interpretation. Yes, yes. And those are the only zeros. Those are the. Every zero is interpretable. Yeah, way. yeah. So, I, so since you are asking for that, so I just want to say that uh, the, the, the other z, so actually all the, okay, the representations which figure in, which uh, contributes to the poles uh, for the edges are those which uh, 
uh, invariant under like parahoric yes, subgroups, yes, okay, and that uh, or the euahoric sub okay. subgroups. Okay. So it's okay. a different. Okay. It's not spherical. Exactly. This is why I say it's not vert vertices. When should I stop? Oh, I have, I have, oh, okay, I have time. Okay, so, so then, uh, then uh, in back to the classical uh, primes, they are finer distributional primes. Okay, it's called the Chebotarov density theorem. Okay. So let me first explain what happens for the uh, the ordinary primes. Okay, so we take a, take a finite Galois extension k of q with the Galois group G, okay. Then for all, for all except finite many primes, P, we can associate a conjugacy class, we call the Frobenius conjugacy class of G. So then you think that uh, for each, almost each P, we have a conjugacy class, okay, of G. But G itself is a finite group. It has only finite many conjugacy classes. So, but uh, there are infinitely many primes, each one gives you a conjugacy class. So there's a lot of overlapping. So we ask the question, we choose a conjugacy class of G, we ask which Frobenius is a conjugacy class of that P is equal to this conjugacy class. So we collect that P. So in other words, in this case we use the, Galois, the conjugacy class of the Galois group to partition the primes. Then we ask, how do the primes distribute with respect to these partitions? Okay. And the Chebotarov density theorem tells us that uh, uh, each of these set has a natural density equal to the size of the conjugacy class over the size of the uh, group. Okay. So let me show you some example. Say if this field is a cyclotomic field joining M through the 1, so in this case, the Galois group is the multiplicity group of Z mod MZ, so it has a phi M element. The group itself is abelian, so each conjugacy class is a singleton. Okay. And uh, for the prime P not dividing M, we can define the uh, Frobenius conjugacy class. In this case, will be some element in the Galois group. And that element is exactly P, but viewed inside here. So now if I give myself a conjugacy class of the Galois group, which is R, I collect the primes such that Frobenius class is equal to R. So by definition, this Frobenius P itself is equal to P. So that means that we are collecting the prime P such that P is count to R mod M. Okay. And Chebotov, the density theorem says that this set has the natural density 1 over phi of M. And we said in another way is that uh, if we look at the primes p up to x, but it is count to r modulo m, so we, if we do not have the congruence condition, we know that number of such prime is x over log x. If now throw in the congruence condition, it tells you that it's 1 over phi <coughs> times the total number of such primes. So it tells you that the primes are uniformly distributed among those progressions mod m. So this is a well-known Dirichlet theorem, and the uh, Chebotarov density theorem is a generalization of this Dirichlet theorem. Okay. And it ha it's quite important in uh, number theory. Okay. So for the Chebotarov density theorem in the general setting, okay, in the case of the uh, Riemann surface coming from the upper plane model by gamma that we talked about before, uh, Peter Sonnach showed that uh, if we consider finite Galois curves, then the Chebotarov density theorem holds. Okay. And uh, for the case of the graph covering, uh, together with Huang, we show that uh, the density theorem in natural density holds if and only if the GCD of the prime upstairs, the same as the GCD of prime downstairs. So for case of graph, the Chebotarov density theorem resembles very much of the Chebotarov density theorem over function fields. It does not always hold, so there's a condition. Okay. And uh, for the uh, uh, finite quotient of two-dimensional uh, complexes uh, we talked about, talk about before, 
We talk about the prime cycles and prime arteries, and we also show that our uh, chapotype density theorem holds. Okay. So uh, to prove the chapotype density theorem, one needs to know more. Namely, we have to study the analytic behavior of the L function associated to finite dimensional unitary representations of gamma. So the, the philosophy is that if you think of your our finite quotient sort of plays the role of uh, Q, then the gamma, the, uh, its universal cover plays the role of Q bar, then the gamma fundamental group plays the role of gamma group. So that's all very parallel. So I would like to finish uh, by saying that uh, we consider uh, those data functions associated to edges and uh, chambers and so on. Uh, they, when we put them together, actually there's very nice expression. Okay. So for that, I have to also introduce data function associated to vertices. Okay. So for the case of graphs, you see it's one over a determinant of degree two in variable u and uses the adjacency operator a. And that's also the same as the heck operator. So for the graphs, you will see that uh, the, the edge, using the edge operator zeta divided by the zeta over the, uh, using the uh, vertex operators, then that quotient is one minus u squared to the Euler characteristic. <coughs> so the chi here is not the, uh, uh, chromatic number. <laughs> it is the all like characteristic. The number of vertices is minus the number of edges. <laughs> okay. And for PGO3, we do the same thing. For the operator of the vertices, we have the two hack operators, A1 and A2. So using them, we have a degree three uh, uh, polynomial here. We take determinant. So uh, this is a joint work with Min Shen Kang. Then we show that uh, if you put a uh, operator of vertices at the bottom, and the uh, operator for the type one edge and the type two edge, except that uh, each step you count the length as a two, and then at the bottom is the chamber. So it's like H0, H1, H2, and it's equal to one minus U cubed to the Euler characteristic. So this is very much uh, similar to the, the zeta function for the varieties. Is this uh, sort of akin to a functional equation for the zeta function as impacted by classically by functor duality and things like that? There is also a zeta function uh, function equation, but it's much simpler than that. Okay. Yeah, it has similar shape. Yeah, it's between u and the one over q u. Yeah. And uh, Min Shen Kang and uh, the JKE proved uh, this sim uh, further generalization of this to PGLN. So for the uh, symplectic group, okay, uh, there are two kinds of the uh, operators, the zeta function associated to the operator of vertices. The spin type has a degree four, and the uh, standard type has degree five. Okay. And so the same, you put the, the op vertex operator spin type on, on the bottom. In the top, you put the edge operator of spin type and standard type, you adjust the length. And the bottom is the chamber operator of spin type. You see that you, on the right-hand side, you have one minus u squared to the Euler characteristic, but uh, it has a little bit more uh, extra factor there. And you can switch spin and the standard on the left-hand side. You have a similar expression, but more complicated for the, uh, using the, the degree five standard uh, zeta function. So these operators are vertex operators. Each of case, they are called a length and cell function. Okay. So here, they, the eigenfunctions are the spherical functions. That's that you're asking. Okay. But uh, not in the other cases. Yeah. So, uh, then the question is uh, what <laughs> Peter already mentioned is that. So we, we start with, from the Selberg's work, that's a PGO2 over R. Then how I make it PGO2 over fine, uh, periodic field. We did it for PGO3 periodic field, PGO4 over periodic field. 
then the question is what are the counterparts of the rank two groups over R? Any idea? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Discussive>. <laughs> so I think that I will stop here. Thank you.